Have you ever wanted to watch every single film to win the Best Picture Award, but over 90 movies seems like too much to tackle? Well, thank God you're here, because I got you covered. Believe it or not, the Best Picture Award has existed since 1927, meaning I've got a lot of watching to do. Today we'll be covering the first 32 films, the award years of 1927 to 1959. This will be chopped into a three-part series, splitting the three definitive eras. These first 32 films are what people might deem boring movies, but before you immediately write them off, allow me to break them down because they aren't as hard to watch as you might think. These first 32 contain some real heat, trust me. Even though these old as hell films are tricky to analyze today, I'll do my best to transport myself back in time mentally for total immersion, and with my incredibly open mind and background of completing challenges, I'm the man for the job. With that said, sit back, watch the evolution of film, get educated, become more cultured as I start my journey of watching every single Best Picture winner. This video will be chopped into five sections, first with a history of the award, then a recap of trends, a breakdown of all 32 films, a ranking of my favorites, and my formula for what makes a Best Picture winner. Now, let's start with the history. Now, if you're not familiar with the history, the Best Picture Award is the final award given at the yearly Academy Awards, aka the Oscars. It's the most prestigious of the night and the one people obsess over the most. People love this award because it basically determines the best movie of the year. Fans love to break down the statistics and the fun facts around this award because it's been around for so long so it's interesting to analyze. Know that the Best Picture Award has gone through a lot of name changes throughout its evolution, which I'll show on screen. Surprisingly, not every great movie is a Best Picture winner. There are several that you think would have won the award but haven't. There are several famous snubs from the past that people like to discuss, but they forget that some years it's a clear winner and other years it's more competitive. Looking back, there might be some debatable calls, but now they serve as time capsules in a sense. Most likely at the time, the decision was widely accepted. You might wonder how they choose the winner. Well, the Academy is a large voting body comprised of actors, directors, producers, past nominees, past winners. They don't disclose exactly who's involved and who chooses the winner but they are the people that vote on the year's films. Also worth noting how the movies that win the coveted best picture award normally sweep most categories. They don't win every award but quite a few. Almost always also best director though. They also snag some other awards such as Golden Globes, Festival Awards, and maybe even a Pulitzer Prize. The amount of films that can be nominated for the award has varied throughout the years. At a time it was 12 and then it was 8, 5, and sometimes 10. The recipient of the award though is the producer. Prior to 1950 it was the production company though. The award has been given at every year's ceremony starting with 1929's first one to present day. It was even awarded before the ceremony was a thing. Now this chunk I'm covering today, award years of 1927 through 1959, is a very interesting era of movies. This was back in the days of avoiding the Hollywood blacklist, cameras weighing hundreds of pounds, and back when kid actors used to be good. This is a batch of movies that fits perfectly into the golden age of Hollywood, late 20s to early 60s. These are films with little to no surviving cast members. These are films so old that G, PG, R ratings weren't even a thing. They just got passed or denied. As you can guess, most of these 32 films are in black and white, with only seven of them being in color. Color became more achievable once Technicolor technology advanced. Technicolor is basically where they use three film strips instead of one and place them behind red, blue, and green film. Filters. Actually, only one of these is a silent film. The rest are talkies, as they're called. Five of the ten musicals to ever win the award are present within these 32, and honestly, that's basically it for the quick need-to-know info of the Best Picture Award history. Now, before we start, let me drop a quick disclaimer. Just know, honestly, I don't wholeheartedly back the idea of the Best Picture Award. I know I'm validating it by making this video, but the idea of comparing all the year's films is a little ridiculous to me, but the competition does produce 
produce good films. With that being said, I do like the Oscars and this award. It's just with the controversy and the weird nominations based off of a system we don't know much about, it gets dicey. Anyway, I like the timeline it provides, but now we got that out of the way, onto the next section of trends. Uh. As someone who's on the journey of watching all Best Picture winners and so far seen 32, I've picked up on some interesting trends you'll notice when watching all of them in order. I'll list the top 10 here starting with pretty prevalent to super prevalent. Starting with visuals off the bat, it's shocking how good some of these movies still look even today. Some have aged very well. With these early winners, visually you'll be noticing staticky pixelation, little circles in the corner to indicate real changes, strange cuts all over the place, weird shadows coming from the old lighting techniques, and a lack of letterboxes. They all use very similar cinematography techniques throughout such as mirror shots, fake vehicle rides using a projector, fading transitions all over the place, obvious stage rain, oil painting backgrounds, scaled down models, and an overall lack of visual effects. In the audio department, you'll notice very quickly how the audio caps easily, there's voiceover dubs all over the place, the dialogue is super difficult to decipher and just begs for subtitles, and you'll notice whenever an actor or actress sings, it switches to a pre-recorded track. This is also a time period of fire movie scores, some real OG bangers that most people would recognize. The way these movies are promoted and represented is nearly identical. First off, they'll always be from one of the big production companies, whether it's MGN, Paramount, Warner Brothers, Fox, etc., all sporting the old dope logos. And those production companies would always boast about the technology used to make the movie, whether it was Technicolor, Cinemascope, VistaVision, Panavision, Metrocolor, or a millimeter flex like filmed in 35 millimeter or 65 or 70. When it came to movie posters and box art, they all maintained a very similar art style, in my opinion, one that's aged well. It's just weird to see a time period where all films share a very similar look style, a style that also carries into the credit sequences, which you'll notice similarities with that too. Another trend you'll see is familiar faces spanning several films, sometimes in a row. This was because movies back then were very star driven and big names were included because of recognizability. Even some small actors will repeat as well you'll catch. This is also because production companies did a lot of loaning actors and actresses around. It was a very common practice back then. For a lot of these stars, you might only recognize them by name, like me, and watching these films helped me put a face to the name. When it comes to how good the acting was back then, you never really see bad acting, or at least it's harder to pick up on. When it comes to physical acting like stunts, for all were they intense, every time you see a stunt on screen, it looks like a guaranteed injury. They really committed to making those stunts look real. Just because these films don't include the normal G, PG, R ratings that we're used to doesn't mean they weren't censored to shit. During production or sometimes after, scenes were removed or manipulated because of the Hays Code, which was put in place to control what's shown to the public on the big screen. The Hays Code was put in place from 1934 to 1968, making a few of these films deemed pre-code. Just know there's no sex scenes whatsoever or really any mention to sex in general. Also nudity, major no-no back then. Also a thing I read time and time again was since a lot of these films are based off of books, plays, or other films, any risque, racy content in those was completely changed for these film adaptations, especially anything dealing with homosexuality, never a mention of that. Oh boy, will you run into some pretty blatant racism in these first 32 films, as you might guess. Several characters throughout the best picture history could definitely be deemed offensive stereotypes. Black, Asian, Indian, you name it. When it comes to storytelling techniques, I respect how majority of these films don't have in-your-face exposition. The closest thing you'll get to spoon-fed storytelling is when a character writes in barely legible cursive you're supposed to read or newspaper headlines are used for a passage of time. I also sense the pattern with the plots for these movies. I notice how it switches in between cut and dry, easy to understand storylines to a little bit more symbolic, a little cryptic, harder to understand plot lines. I enjoy both. I appreciated the variety. 
One of my favorite trends to keep track of was the insane prices for things back then compared to now. Just know there's been major inflation since then. Money isn't the only thing. There are several aspects of these films I deem generational differences, such as a ton of slapping, overall poor treatment of women in general, every male character honestly gives off predator vibes. You also have poor treatment of animals and pets. You'll notice how characters will use the word gay a bunch, but for its happy definition, which is almost never used today. Short life and a gay one. Hmm? A short life barren and a gay one. That's very true in my case. And you'll notice how characters talk so close to one another. I don't know if that was a thing back then, but it'll definitely catch your eye. This is a big one. War is a huge component of the early Best Picture winners. Most plots will follow whatever war is happening at the time. It is so crazy how half these films will either mention World War II or World War I depending on release. Not only do the wars seep into most storylines, but they impact a lot of the actual productions with some of these films having to deal with war shortages. One of the most common by far trends is the crazy fast marriages. Not only will every film contain a relationship, which I could take or leave, but they will almost always get married or want to after the first date. This is combined with the overuse of the word love, my God. What I deem the number one most common trend is the insane consumption of alcohol and cigarette smoke. My God, is it prevalent. Each film will contain at least one character who smokes and or loves alcohol. Back then, it was the look of a cool guy, but just know nowhere but these older films will you see more cigarettes and alcohol. I feel like most people know this to be true, but don't understand the sheer abundance of users back then. I had to mention. Wings from 1927, notable for not only being the first film to win the Best Picture Award at the time called Best Production, but the only silent film to ever win, unless you include 2012's The Artist. Wings follows two men who join the army as fighter pilots to fight in the First World War. They start off as enemies, but slowly become friends, and together they achieve success, endure loss, all while loving the same girl back at home. For being close to 100 years old, this was surprisingly good. It contains some really impressive shots and sequences even to today's standards and it's just a joy to watch something world war one related instead of the normal world war ii wings has a pretty interesting history at the time there was two awards equivalent to the best picture award the other being best artistic quality of production awarded to the film sunrise but later it was decided that wings was the definitive winner of the best picture this also weirdly is the only film to win the one time awarded oscar for engineering effects the first film to have actors flying in air which is insane they even pulled that off and one of the first films ever to contain nudity which it's really subtle and it was allowed because it's a pre-code film with it being a silent film of course there's title cards instead of dialogue sort of a required subtitles and the only actual audio comes from a musician an organist in this case who scores the film while it's playing in theaters Throughout, there's some really great large-scale scenes with a ton of extras, insane set destruction, intense dogfights, sped up shots to fake speed, which was a common technique back then, and hardcore stunts where several people got injured and sadly one even died. The movie withstood a really long theater run because of people's fascination at the time with Charles Lindbergh, the famous aviator. I mean, I get it. It's well made, it's thrilling throughout, and mad impressive for the time. <laughs> Next is the Broadway Melody from 1929. Know that technically no film in 1928 won the award because of the strange release qualification window. Now, the Broadway Melody was actually in sound with occasional title cards. The case for a lot of these early winners is there was a silent version released alongside the sound original because theaters were still catching up with the technology. The story follows two sisters, former vaudeville performers, who try to make it on Broadway with the help of their friend Eddie who has a number he's trying to get picked up by a big show. 
all is good until relationships start to complicate things. Now, not a big fan of this one, kind of a snoozer. I'll give it a pass because it's an early sound film, and I bet writing compelling dialogue and detailed stories was probably pretty difficult in the beginning. As you can guess by the title, it's a musical. MGN's first musical, actually, and their first all-talking film. It spawned a ton of sequels, which I accidentally bought one in the beginning by mistake, and now it's known for causing a boom in the production of musicals back then because it showed with sound technology what's possible. It's also known for including a single scene using two-color Technicolor, red and green, but now it's deemed lost to time. The Broadway Melody is also sadly known for being the worst reviewed film to ever win the Best Picture. I'm not the biggest musical fan in the first place, so this just isn't for me. I was non-stop confused by the plot and I kept mixing up the sisters. One of them's even named Hank. I mean, all the characters are pretty unlikable and toxic. It's just confusing who to root for. Little sucky, but again, it gets a pass because it's old as hell and it was mad innovative for the musical genre. Winner of 1930, All Quiet on the Western Front follows a group of young German soldiers fighting in a war they don't know much about. They struggle with who's the true enemy, is it worth it, what's worth fighting for, all while enduring hell on the battlefield. Again, it's nice to see another film about the less talked about First World War. All Quiet on the Western Front has such a fresh perspective of showing the German side of the war, which it feels weird to even root for them or understand where they're coming from, but it works. I personally enjoyed this film quite a bit. I knew it was a classic, but had no idea of the unique storyline. I really liked how character driven it was, and I love the inclusion of those large scale action scenes that are really prevalent in these older films. The accuracy they achieved with this film is quite impressive with the authentic looking uniforms and equipment, the story being based off real life accounts, and the crazy fact that most of the 2000 extras were Germans who moved to the US after the war. The film's subject matter is so realistic and serious that the director was adamant about no score at all, which theaters weren't used to that so they added their own music against his wishes. The whole thing's controversial with it showing empathy to the Germans, the super high budget for the time, tensions post-war, its inclusion of gore, and Germans attacking theaters that showed the film. The director is also notable for using his own hand for the final scene of the film instead of the character the movie depicts it belonging to. He added the scene way after filming, contrasting the famous book, but it became an iconic scene nonetheless. This is another case where anytime you see a stunt, you just know someone got hurt. I mean, I really love that hardcore aspect about these older films. I mean, even with the long runtime, All Quiet on the Western Front is a must-see, sad, but thrilling war film. Next up, Cimarron from 1931 is a story following a man named Yancey Kravitz and his family who moved to the newly opened Oklahoma Territory to start a family newspaper. Yancey, though, can't be held down in one place, leaving his wife to make a life of her own. Decent film, not the worst, not my favorite. It does have some redeemable qualities, though, like, again, those large-scale, extra-heavy scenes, like when the territory is newly opened by the government and nearly 5,000 extras rush to get land. And there are some funny parts here and there. The whole western feel of this movie makes it an entertaining watch. It's not the most gripping film ever, but with it containing some really cool landscapes, some impressively built sets, and some old-timey wardrobe and slang makes it worth watching. And there are some Red Dead vibes here and there. Cimarron is one of those movies with a large focus on family and their trials and tribulations through different periods of time, a very common thing to see in these older films. They actually age the actors and actresses 40 years with makeup pretty successfully, honestly. Now this movie has some pretty prevalent racism, heavy stereotype depictions, scenes that did not age well and are the contributing factor to the present day poor reviews compared to the overwhelming critical praise upon release. Simron's history is interesting with it being considered the worst performance financially for a best picture winner. This is largely because the Great Depression was occurring during, but overall it's deemed a box office failure. The concept makes for a good, enjoyable movie, actually surprisingly good for the time. People even think it's better than the book it's based off of, which is based off a real guy, but overall, it has some dicey, dated scenes, but impressively made for the time. From Book 
to Broadway play to hit movie, 1932 gave us Grand Hotel, a film renowned for its insanely stacked cast of stars. It was a huge success despite being the only best picture film to only be nominated for one award. Grand Hotel follows a group of varied individuals who visit the most lavish and expensive hotel, the Grand Hotel. Each character enjoys their stay while dealing with their own relationship and money related dramas. Grand Hotel is known for being an example of instead of having just one star in the lead role and stretching out star power to as many films as possible, instead having five of the biggest names in one picture. It was never done back then and it changed casting from there on out. I really liked this one. The story keeps you hooked and the variety of well-written, memorable characters makes you care about the plot and the way each character's story intertwines into each other is pretty clever. Visually, definitely a step up. It includes some real impressive shots sprinkled throughout and includes some rarely seen slide transitions. Plus, some of those perspectives of those shots and angles was deemed really influential for movies to come. And a cool thing about the production is when they wanted to avoid the sound of footsteps, they had all the cast members put socks over their shoes and went through 200 pairs of socks every day of production. When people first heard about the star-studded cast, they assumed egos would clash, but the filming actually went fine and the actress chemistry was great. Even the love on screen carried off screen with the iconic kiss lasting three minutes after the cut. Its impact is pretty crazy. It has countless spin-offs and parodies based off of it. It set a new standard for ticket pricing when released. It had an actual hotel's design based around it, and it includes a classic line of I want to be alone. Grand Hotel is a need to see. It set a lot of precedents and it's pretty watchable even for the 30s. Cavalcade from 1933 is another one of those movies where it revolves around a family. Two families this time, one rich, one poor, and you view past historical events through their perspective and you witness how the events impact them. Those events include the Second Boer War, the death of Queen Victoria, the Titanic sinking, and the First World War. Now I love the concept of fictional characters living through real life events. I think it's genius and they achieve it with great success. The movie ended up being way deeper than I originally thought. Deep in a good way. Definitely a highlight amongst the 32. The film starts off feeling like any other, but when they start name dropping events, you're instantly hooked. Especially there's a long scene on a ship where a couple is sharing an intimate moment. And once they disband, you realize the whole time they've been aboard the Titanic epic reveal. Cavalcade includes some really dope sequences throughout, especially the fading transition war montage section. It's really well done. It's really effective at establishing the mood and mindset of people during World War I back at home. The plot goes through a large time range of 1899 to 1933, where you'll watch the characters age like in Cimarron. It's cool to see in this film, unlike most, where there's a New Year's countdown from 1999 to the year 2000, and this film it's 1899 to the year 1900, which is just crazy. Again, a movie based off a play. A play of such large scale that it was rarely performed and never revived. Cavalcade is also notable for being one of the first films to include the word damn and hell, but it was given a pass by the censors because of their use in the play. Not the easiest film to follow, not gonna lie, I got lost a little bit, but just know it's not a surface level casual watch. It's still good though. I'd definitely throw a fatty recommendation on it. Nineteen thirty four birth a banger. That being, it happened one night. A story of a news reporter who meets a famous woman on the run. They make a deal that he'll help her get back to her husband in exchange for a good news story, but it doesn't go as planned. This was a real good one. My favorite up to this point. I swear any film with Clark Gable is gonna be a hit. When you have the lead be not only an absolute badass, but also hilarious, that's a recipe for a good film. He wasn't even supposed to be in this movie in the first place. He got casted as punishment. I just thought the plot was really good concept that was well executed. That combined with the really good chemistry between the two leads, the funny memorable lines, and the super satisfying ending made me a big fan. The history behind this movie is insane. The two lead stars hated filming their parts. The roles were turned down by so many actors and actresses, and just everyone thought this movie was gonna be a huge flop, but man were they wrong. It rejuvenated Columbia Pictures, becoming one of their biggest hits. One of the few Best Picture winners to win all five of the big categories, and it's credited for being the first screwball comedy. This film has a lot of weird influences with bus travel increasing because of a lot of great 
Greyhound bus travel scenes and the fact that Clark Gable had a hard time putting on an undershirt so he just abandoned it and it became cool to not wear an undershirt so sales apparently went down and underwear companies threatened to sue Columbia. It was legitimately thought to even be one of Hitler's and Stalin's favorite films. Regardless, I didn't think much off the cover and title but I was pleasantly surprised. It's a simple premise, crazy history, and really entertaining. Then 1935 rolled around and we got Mutiny on the Bounty, directed by a previously winning director and yet another Clark Gable film. This time he doesn't have his iconic mustache because he had to shave it off because of historical accuracy, but he's spectacular nonetheless. Mutiny on the Bounty is an exhilarating story about the real life Captain Bly who commanded the ship named the Bounty. He proved to be a tyrannical, cruel captain whose overly harsh command led first mate Christian to mutiny with the crew. This was a needed break from the typical relationship heavy movie. Movies. The set of the 1700s era ships that they actually built for the film were a really nice change of pace visually, even though they proved to be a little dangerous during production. I really got a kick out of this film. I mean, you wouldn't think a movie from 1935 would grip you as much as this one does. I was entertained start to finish with the great build-up, action-packed sequences, and amazing character development. The character of Captain Bly, played by Charles Lawton, is well written, even if deemed historically inaccurate, but seriously a contender for the most most annoying character of all time. He's a great villain, but he was asking for a mutiny. The history of this movie is kind of wild. This film is the reason behind the Best Supporting Actor award because they had too many actor nominations. And those two lead actors who hated each other on screen hated each other even more in real life, which just added to the on-screen clashing. Clark did not like Charles during production, partially because he was homosexual, which is funny because Clark doesn't give, let's say, his straightest performance ever. Mutiny on the Bounty is also notable for being banned in the Empire of Japan because of its depiction of revolution. Anyway, it's a great film that reels you in from the start, and I really recommend looking into the history of the actual ship. It's super interesting. The Great Ziegfeld from 1936 is a biopic about the extravagant Florenz Ziegfeld. It follows his iconic, over-the-top, glamorous shows, rocky relationships, and interesting rise to stardom. A Broadway melody the film we covered earlier is loosely based off this guy. This is a long boy, debatably too long. I did sort of enjoy it though. I like a biopic here and there, but this one just had some serious dragging moments and some weird story flow. That's mostly because a large percentage of the runtime is musical numbers. Like a half of the movie is a play. The actual character of Ziegfeld is an intriguing character. His backstory is wild. He's really a one-of-a-kind guy. Throughout the film, he's just battling putting on these grand shows while being broke at the same time. Still a badass though, and he gives this smart idiot vibe like a Jack Sparrow or a Howard from Uncut Gems kind of thing. What the great Ziegfeld really has going for it is the visuals, especially the nearly five minute long single take shot of the Ziegfeld Follies. Super impressively built set that cost a huge chunk of the budget to replicate. It's even thought to have cost more than the Ziegfeld original. Contains some really unique over-the-top sequences that give the whole film this large-scale big-budget feel. That was MGN's goal with the making of this movie, making it feel equivalent to watching an original Ziegfeld show. The budget was so high for this movie, it even switched studios halfway through production. Other interesting facts include that there were some original Ziegfeld Follies performers in this film portraying them Themselves. It was the longest all-talking film up to that point and one of the extras in the film was Nixon's wife Not the most gripping thought-provoking film I've ever seen But it is interesting to watch this strange half mix of musical and normal plot movie People think it didn't age well with it being too much emphasis on glamour But I'll tell you what didn't age well that blackface scene though Then 1937 brought us our second biopic in a row, The Life of Emile Zola, a film that follows the controversial author known for his polarizing opinions. You follow his rise to fame and discovery of a wrongfully accused soldier that needs his help. I'm kinda so-so on this film. It kept my attention, but I wouldn't say I love it. The issue I have mostly is the breakneck speed of the storytelling. Even though it's almost two hours long, I felt like every part of the plot was rushed and squeezed into the runtime. Watching Emile rise through the ranks is 
enjoyable enough. It just follows that typical biopic formula, so it's nothing crazy. The character of Emil is very well written, and I enjoy how he writes negative but true things, and he's a movie hero that not everyone likes. It's a nice change of pace. Like I said with the fast pace, the film covers Emil's early life rather quickly and then shifts focus to a Jewish soldier named Alfred Dreyfus who is wrongfully accused of leaking information and imprisoned even after being proven not guilty. Once Emil hears word of the injustice occurring because of the anti-semitism, he intervenes and writes a book proclaiming his innocence. I don't mind the dramatic story shift, it's just the film turns into a typical courtroom movie from there on out. To be honest, the most interesting aspect of this film is the crazy controversial history. The film gives this persona of fighting anti-Semitism. The whole plot is centered around it, but the studio boss responsible for this film didn't want the word Jew uttered at all during the movie. This was because Warner Brothers didn't want to offend the Nazi regime and hurt sales in Germany. I mean, that's some unseen levels of hypocrisy, and the whole message of the movie loses all impact once you know that. On a lighter note, the director chose to film this movie in reverse chronological order so the actor playing Emil could grow a full beard, trim it down, and color it to reverse age. I mean, it's cool, but overall, interesting movie, but dicey backstory. With 1938 came another banger. You can't take it with you. A film centered around money, perspective, and class. The phrase you can't take it with you refers to what good is being rich and having money when you can't take it with you when you die. The story follows a couple, one with a girl that's part of a fun, diverse family of people following their passions and loving what they do, and the guy is the son of a large businessman who only cares about growing his company. It creates a unique situation with the businessman father only needing one more house to sign over ownership so he can build a factory. And that one house happens to be the girl's home and it's full of people who could care less about money, only happiness. You Can't Take It With You has a very young James Stewart who does a great job. He's such a likable lead paired with the other great acting performances like the grandfather who was in the earlier Best Picture winner, Grand Hotel. It's a personal favorite of mine within the 32 because it's just a solid, wholesome, easy to understand, predictable film. Sometimes you need that, and it's a bit of a tearjerker during the end, no cap. It's just, I love the premise of government versus family. It's well executed here. The film was adapted from a popular play from a few years prior, and the only way they could make this film was when the director had to spend an expensive amount of $200,000 for the rights to that play. That director being Frank Capra, fun fact, also directed It Happened One Night. That grandpa character I mentioned earlier, played by Lionel Barrymore, was changed from the original play because at the time he had crippling arthritis so they wrote into the story that he hurt his ankle hence the crutches anyway you really gotta watch this one if you want a quick pick me up it's got a great setup great cast of characters and a feel-good satisfying end Nineteen thirty nine delivered us a film known for literally being the most successful film of all time, the highest rated movie to ever be shown on TV, being based off an insanely popular book, being the first color film to ever win the best picture, and the longest to ever win, clocking in at nearly four hours. Gone with the Wind. This was such an epic film. Some deem it overrated, but not me. The sheer scale and production of this film was never before seen. Nearly half of the US saw this movie upon release. I mean, some really next level scale. I mean, just look into the casting for this film. That was even insane. Of course, I gotta mention the man, the myth, the legend, Clark Gable back for his third best picture role. And he's great as always. He plays the classic suave know-it-all and I just love it he's such a goddamn badass boy was this film controversial and racist the way it depicts black stereotypes slave ownership and confederates being the good guys all did not age well they commend the fact that they gave a black actress an Oscar for the first time but that's about all they mention. on a lighter note Gone with the Wind has some marvelous looking shots throughout and some really cool locations combined with some awesome set destruction and the Technicolor in this film 
looks pretty damn good. They actually had to use every single Technicolor camera Hollywood had at the time to even film this movie. The story isn't knock your socks off amazing, but it covers a lot of ground. The plot is such a roller coaster throughout the four hours, and typically I'm not a couple based movie kind of guy, but Scarlett and Rhett's chemistry is unique and it works. I like seeing a non traditional couple. So many fun facts. You got Alfred Hitchcock helped a bit, they mixed dummies in with the extras to increase scale, Clark ate garlic before every makeout scene to add to Scarlett's dislike on screen, the two leads got paid crazy different amounts because of the time period, and Michael Jackson owns the Best Picture Oscar for this film. You can't not mention that one of the most iconic lines ever is from this film. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. Which cost the producer a $5,000 fine because you can't use curse words. Anyway, it's such a monumental grand film that is an essential watch. Trust me. Next is Rebecca from 1940, directed by THE Alfred Hitchcock, produced by the same guy who produced Gone with the Wind and is our first mystery film. We're back to black and white, even though last film was color, but this was because Alfred wanted to keep the dark tone of the original book. The story revolves around a girl who recently married a rich man. When she moves in, she quickly realizes that everyone that works for him is obsessed with the previous wife, Rebecca, especially the housekeeper, and you watch as the main character uncovers Rebecca's past. I thought Rebecca overall was a pretty enjoyable watch. I was still riding the hype off of Gone with the Wind, but I liked it nonetheless. I really enjoy how the audience and the main character are in the same perspective of watching the events unravel. That paired with the great tone setting music make for a really unique experience. The film is filled with a bunch of foreshadowing, great acting performances, especially from the main actress and housekeeper. It also contains a really impressively built half scale model of the castle where most of the film takes place. Rebecca is also filmed using this technique called deep focus photography that achieves a unique depth. The pace of Rebecca is perfect. It keeps you on your toes and has a nice satisfying mystery conclusion. The couple again isn't that bland nobody cares chemistry. There's more than meets the eye with the two on screen. This is actually Alfred Hitchcock's first film in Hollywood and from the sounds of it he sounded like he was a major pain in the ass to work with on set. Besides being known as a Hitchcock film this film popularized the coat worn by the main actress that is still to this day called the Rebecca. Based off a famous book like I said but because of the codes for film at the time, mild spoiler, the murder plotline had to be tweaked quite a bit. Regardless, it's a thrilling, engaging film that is a solid first mystery entry. Known for being the Citizen Kane killer, 1941 brought us How Green Was My Valley from the director with the most best director wins ever, John Ford. The story is a bit hard to explain, but it mostly follows a family in a small mining town who work hard for their money and try to make their lives better. Some relationships form and change throughout, and it's all viewed through the perspective of their youngest child, Hugh. Don't get me wrong, spectacular looking movie, definitely best cinematography up to this point, but I'm just not a giant fan because of the kind of non-plot. What I mean is characters exist and they grow but it's not too structured it doesn't really go anywhere in my opinion maybe I missed something but I was just kind of confused throughout it's pretty hard to follow I'd say entertaining but the story leaps all over the place even the title had me confused I mean it's in no means a bad film it's just not really my thing it's one of the first best picture winners to have heavy narration which is a nice added element even with that there's not really enough exposition though you eventually figure everything out it just takes a while cool side fact it was filmed in black Black and white because the landscapes and locations weren't time period accurate color wise, hence avoiding the technicolor. How Green Was My Valley contains some killer shots and some really cool sets they filmed at. It really made it stand out visually for sure. It aged well and despite the tearjerker ending, I'd give it a thumbs up. Then 1942 produced Mrs. Miniver, a film about a Mrs. Miniver who is universally liked by everyone in the town so much that a rose is named after her to enter the town competition. You watch as the Miniver family lives a pretty normal life until the war comes and changes the status quo. I mention a rose because a large portion of the film follows a competition where every year the town picks the best looking rose. It's normally won by the same stubborn old lady, but when a rose named after the title character enters, it gets competitive. The other portion of the runtime follows the 
middle class men of her family during this time World War II, first time for a Best Picture winner, and the plot also follows this young couple in love, but I could take or leave that section honestly. Mrs. Miniver is alright. It's a little deeper than I initially thought, and I like how they handled the war aspect, and Franklin D. Roosevelt liked this film's take on the war so much that he ordered it to be used as propaganda. Even Winston Churchill was also a fan. I thought the main characters were all pretty well acted. I don't know about Toby though, he's in the running for one of the most annoying child actors, but the cast was comprised mostly of English actors. The film even shares a lead with the previous winner, How Green Was My Valley. The story has a rough start, being pretty cut and dry, spoon fed, but picks up greatly when the tone shifts to the more serious war topic. There's a lot of needed twists to keep attention, but sadly includes a lot of no heads up time jumps all over the place. Like I said with the war topic, and propaganda use, Germany weirdly hated this movie, even though it doesn't negatively mention them at all. And like I said with the rose competition, there was a real life rose species grown called the Mrs. Miniver, just like in the story. The actual actress that played Mrs. Miniver really did a great job. I mean, she sold the film for me. She even ended up winning Best Actress and set the record for the longest acceptance speech ever. Anyway, this film definitely wasn't my favorite. I'd say overall, pretty mediocre. Nineteen forty three unearthed a legendary film. Casablanca, widely regarded as one of the best films of all time, and rightfully so. Casablanca is home to so many quotables, a great setting, fantastic chemistry between leads, classic songs, and the epic Humphrey Bogart. This happens to be one I've seen previously, and I'm embarrassed to admit I fell asleep the first time, but this time I was gripped. It's a great, thrilling, unique story with solid writing, a great cast of characters, and an epic ass ending. I'm a big fan. The story follows Rick, who owns a cafe known for harboring refugees. In there, he runs into an old lover of his and battles whether or not to help her and her husband escape Casablanca. The story actually coincided with real life events at the time, so it added a lot of impact and boosted sales. The production was known for its crazy diverse cast stemming from 34 different countries. The cast is also known for having all the Nazi characters being played by escaped German Jews who were apprehensive about taking the role but thought it would help war efforts. I just really liked the premise of a bunch of Americans and a variety of refugees trying to get their hands on illegal visas to escape Africa because of Nazi control. It leads to countless epic moments. The making of the film is notable for using little people in a scaled down plane for a scene. That plane is now located at Disney. There being several versions of the film because of foreign conflict. Ronald Reagan was rumored to be Rick. I mean there's too many crazy facts to cover. The length of Casablanca felt short but it felt right. I think it proves that a sub two hour runtime can lend to a more attention holding film. The whole time I was watching, I was just blown away with how ahead of its time it appears. It's so obvious when you watch the preceding films. Casablanca proved movies were really taking it to the next level, and I finally can say I understand the hype behind this film. Never again will I be snoozing through this mad classic. 1st one had a lot to live up to. Did 1944 produce another slapper? Not quite, but not bad. Going My Way, starring the spectacular Bing Crosby, which up to this point I only knew about his musical career, was an okay film, made better with his inclusion. The story is centered around Bing's character of Father O'Malley, who is sent to a church in financial trouble with the hope of helping them out. Once he arrives, he struggles to win over the previous apprehensive priest, but eventually they warm up to each other. Even though this felt like a step backwards from Casablanca, it's hard to dislike. It's got a pretty heartwarming, unique story, and paired with Bing's charismatic, charming persona, it makes you overlook the visuals and the slow pace. The slowly growing relationship between the two priests is pretty enjoyable. The rest of the story is pretty run of the mill. Just know there's a huge emphasis on music in this movie, a lot of songs, some bangers. The whole thing felt like a Bing Crosby flex, like he had a song quota he had to reach for this film. The awards given to this movie are pretty interesting. First off, it won one for the music, which is no surprise. There was a big emphasis, but the actor Barry Fitzgerald was nominated for Best Supporting Actor and Best Actor at the same time. The only time that's ever happened, they even changed the rules after that. When he actually won the Supporting Actor, they gave him a plastic statue because of metal wartime shortages. Even with how wholesome this movie is, it's actually banned in a few countries because of Ben Crosby's priest uniform, including a white shirt. Little ridiculous if you ask me, but regardless, it's a decent casual watch if you want a mood lifter.
Now for a not so feel goody but unique film, The Lost Weekend from 1945, a depressing story of a troubled writer who is severely alcoholic and through a weekend attempts to kick his gripping addiction. I was pleasantly surprised with the different story we got with The Lost Weekend. I mean it's about time Hollywood started promoting something that's anti-alcohol instead of glamorizing it in every other film. It was also refreshing to not have war mentioned at all, it was like the only time it wasn't. Ray Milan did such a great job depicting a drunk. It's funny because in real life he didn't drink at all. The message this movie gave off really hit home with a lot of people and convinced a lot of war vets to kick the addiction as well. It even scared the liquor industry so much they reportedly offered 5 million to not make the film. There are several good looking shots, there was a passing time effect that was showcased in this film and popularly used after its release. The soundtrack was even a great atmosphere builder, especially with its use of the theremin for the first time ever. Let me tell you, The Lost Weekend grips you from the start. A movie based solely around a single man's addiction is a refreshing premise. It's told with a lot of flashbacks, which it can be confusing when one stops and starts, but it still tells a great story. The movie is actually based off a book called The Last Weekend. The director came out years later saying it was a typo all along. You might also know this film for its infamous bad scene. You gotta check this out. The story really picks up when he visits this super intense drinking ward towards the later half of the movie. It's all based upon him going to a real drinking ward for prep for this film which ended in a really funny story. Anyway, if you want a movie from this time period that's different from the rest, The Lost Weekend's for you. Check it out. With 1946 came a sleeper. The best years of our life. I'm not a big fan of this one. I know people love this film and maybe I missed something, but I was on NyQuil mode throughout. I kind of knew I wasn't going to like it off the cover and title, if I'm being honest. The story follows three soldiers who return home from war and realize several things are different. Each soldier's family readjusts in their own way and each struggle with their own problems upon return of the men. To me, it took a long time to get going. I mean, it took forever to establish the plot. It's not absolutely terrible but it just majorly drags. I get a lot of these films are about the impact of war but I'm just getting tired of it up to this point. I get the point but at the same time I don't. The Best Years of Our Life does contain an interesting character though of Homer Parrish played by Harold Russell who has hooks for hands because of a war injury and upon looking it up they're real hooks for the same reasons. He's actually the only actor to ever receive two Oscars for the same role which is pretty awesome. This film is also notable for for having the same director as Mrs. Miniver, who's actually mentioned in the storyline and has an actress from that film as well. Even though the movie is a bit of a slow mover, there are some highlights like some funny one-liners, some interesting cinematography, and a hilarious scene where this guy falls through a table. But to be honest, the characters are all pretty unlikable and I think I just missed what everyone seems to love about this film. I respect the serious topics of veteran PTSD, job availability, and family struggles, but I won't be coming back. From Sleeper to Slapper, 1947's Gentleman's Agreement, starring the infamous Gregory Peck, aka Atticus Finch, ringing any high school bells, is a spectacular film about perspective and anti-semitism. Gentleman's Agreement initially gave me the vibe of a standard relationship film, but man was I wrong. It's way better. The story is about an accomplished writer who's about to write a story about anti-semitism. Then he decides he's going to be Jewish for six months to witness the prejudice firsthand. Such a unique concept for a film. It's so interesting to watch unravel. Once he commits to being Jewish and tells no one, and he slowly realizes how bad the prejudice it truly is. It gives him a fresh perspective of the people around him and of the world. Gentleman's Agreement was originally based off a book where the character pretends to be homosexual instead of Jewish interestingly enough and as you can guess this film is mad controversial. It was even banned in a few areas. It's so epic to watch the people that Philip, the main character, thought he was close to aren't as they seem. During his six months undercover he tests his family and friends to see their reactions and what they do and say is crazy to observe. The whole film is honestly so well 
written and well acted and the ending reveal is so satisfying. The whole story really reminded me of this book Black Like Me I read a long time ago. Very similar premise where a guy acts as a black man to test reactions. Overall, highly recommend. It really opens your eyes to how people thought back then. Gentlemen's Agreement, watch it. Next is Hamlet from 1948, of course based off the classic Shakespearean story, starring and directed by Lawrence Oliver, who is responsible for several Shakespeare adaptations, and he's also one of the leads in Rebecca if you don't recognize him. The plot follows the classic Hamlet, except for a few character omissions and story tweaks. The story follows the young prince Hamlet, who discovers his uncle is to blame for the murder of his king father, and he struggles on whether or not to seek revenge. Now, I'm not a Shakespeare guy, making me not a fan of this film. I'm sorry, but the dialogue almost requires a translation. Everyone talks like Yoda, and I'm just struggling to follow the story. Very much not my thing. Shakespeare purists had issues with it not being as faithful to the source material as other adaptations, but it won nonetheless. It was even the first non-American film to win the award, with it being from the UK. Just know that there's been several movie versions of Hamlet. This is just one of them. Lawrence Oliver, the director, lied about filming it in black and white. He said it was for artistic artistic reasons, but in reality he was just struggling with Technicolor. Know that Hamlet was also filmed using deep focus photography, like Rebecca. It gives that extra depth, like I said. The little I liked from this movie includes the supernatural elements, which are rarely seen in Best Picture winners, the really elaborate sets, the fact that the actor who played Count Dooku is present in this film, and even though the story was a little so-so, the ending play slash duel was pretty epic. Talking about that supernatural element, that being the dead king who returns, is actually voiced by Lawrence Oliver. Oliver, it's just pitched down. But other than those tidbits, Hamlet is a snooze fest. The overdramatic acting paired with the indecipherable Old English is just such an L. Anyway, it is cool to hear about the story of Hamlet and the previous winners and then watch it. I mean, it's pretty timeless and a lot of people know it, but maybe because I'm not a big theater guy, I can't appreciate it. Just in my opinion, Hamlet is a take or leave. The 40s closed up with All the King's Men in 1949, based on a true story of a small town politician, Willie Stark, who is well liked, genuine, and humble. A reporter follows his rise through the ranks and slow turn to corruption. All the King's Men was actually mad good. It was real fast paced, easy to understand story, centered around a great gonna say it again, badass character performed by Broderick Crawford, who was actually drunk most of the time during filming to get into character. The character was initially offered to John Wayne, but he turned it down because he thought the role was unpatriotic. All the characters on screen do a great job. This is maybe partially because the director would only let them see their line one time and they'd just have to wing the rest of it. Willie Stark honestly gives off strong Alex Jones Trump vibes throughout, but it works. His voice is also dead ass the same as Dexter's dad. He kind of serves as a hero villain that everyone starts off loving, then hates, and maybe even dies because of. All the King's Men contain some really good looking shots, which is the case for most of these Best Picture winners, but in the case for the ending for this film, it was a little eh, but overall, I deem the movie worth watching. To start off the last decade discussed today is 1950's All About Eve, a story of a normal girl named Eve who's obsessed with theater and especially theater star Margot. Margot takes Eve under her wing not knowing how deceptive and manipulative Eve ends up being. Now this is a beloved movie by a lot of people. It's very celebrated for Betty Davis's role as Margot, it being the birthplace to several iconic lines, and it having more female nominations than any other film ever. And don't get me wrong, it's okay, it's just not great. Even though the title is all about Eve, the story is more centered around the character of Margot as she struggles with her future career, getting older, less roles being offered, and getting replaced. There were several things about the film I enjoyed. The beginning narration was a nice intro, I like how the story starts with the beginning and then retells the rest of the story, and the large cast of varied characters is nice, even one of them being Marilyn Monroe. The premise of a humble, idolizing theater girl who is plotting, scheming, pulling strings, and sliming her way through the ranks, I thought 
thought was a pretty solid premise, it just failed to grip me, honestly. Like I mentioned with the famous lines coming from this film, most notably, fasten your seatbelts, it's gonna be a bumpy ride, is interesting because cars at the time didn't even have seatbelts, it was actually referring to planes, and this is another movie where, yet again, there's Ronald Reagan casting rumors. There's also a really cool backstory with the actresses having a similar role reversal in real life. The actress who played Eve kind of stole an Oscar from the actress who played Margot, very similar to how it played out on screen. Even though I struggled to follow the plot 100%, I think the ending reveal was pretty epic regardless. I mean, people really jerked this film, and I can say I don't mind it, I just definitely don't love it. Then, 1951 brought us our second color film to win the Best Picture Award, An American in Paris, starring the legend Gene Kelly, known for his role in Singing in the Rain, and a large portion of this film is actually directed by him even though he's the lead, similar to Lawrence Oliver in Hamlet. The story goes like this, an American painter is living in Paris and he struggles to sell his work. A rich lady discovers him and not only is interested in his work, but him. He instead loves a French girl who's in a relationship with a buddy of his which complicates things. The fact that this film is in color actually adds a lot. Crazy, vibrant, beautiful looking sets throughout. 44 sets actually. I mean, especially the intro colorful dancing scene. Super ahead of its time visually. A great, impressive start to the movie. Gene Kelly is so perfect for this lead. He's a crazy good dancer and he's great with the ladies. A real sly guy. You watch as he tries so hard to get the girl he wants and he even breaks the rule I established earlier with the one date marriages. He wants to get married before the first date. I also like his piano playing friend. He's amazing. Know that An American in Paris has a crap load of music in it. So many musical numbers. Even the last 20 minutes of the film is a no dialogue, super elaborate, colorful ballet sequence. It's really cool though. Top notch choreography. Even though it was a visual spectacle, the play like ending loosely ties into the plot. In my opinion, it leaves some plot lines unresolved, but it is really cool. It took him a month to film it and $500,000. An American in Paris is definitely above average with the charming Gene Kelly, Clark Gregg look-alike lead, the best looking sets yet, and an overall feel-good vibe. It's better than expected and a really good example of utilizing early color. Yet another color form came in the form of The Greatest Show on Earth in 1952, an epic story of high-level acrobats battling for the top spot, elephant trainers in a struggling relationship, and a clown escaping his dicey past. The scale of this film is insane. The fictional circus they follow is actually the real-life Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus who helped with the production of this film. Watching this, it feels like you're actually there. It's a similar entertainment value and similar anxiety from the performances. Everything feels so real because you first watch how the big top tent is erected documentary style with 1400 extras and all the actors and actresses had to learn their respected circus roles so that led to legit stunts there was hundreds of animals involved a ton of equipment i mean just a crazy production behind this film i really got a kick out of the greatest show on earth i mean it stars my boy charles heston the goat who was casted purely on how he waved to the director when he first met him it stars my other boy bing amongst many other cameos you're hooked right off the Bat. It's such a great batch of diverse characters with stories you care about, especially Buttons the Clown played by James Stewart. It just contains a lot of funny lines, foreshadowing, and some sick sequences, especially that train crash part. That was epic. You'll notice a lot of shoddy green screen effects with a lot of green haze around characters, but it gets a pass because of its age. And there's a couple of yikes lines in this movie. Why is it whenever he's around I'm all wet? In more ways than one. But I really did enjoy it, even though a large portion of people don't like this film, weirdly enough. 1952 was also the first year they started televising the award ceremony, meaning this award is really going to the next level. And with these next couple of movies, we're entering classic territory. Combined with two color films in a row, it had me thinking color's gotta be here to stay. I was wrong. We are back to the classic black and white with From Here to Eternity in 1953. You might recognize this film for the iconic beach makeout scene or the fact that Frank Sinatra is present, which he's way skinnier than I originally thought. My God. The story follows a soldier known for being a half decent boxer. Once his new unit discovers this, they attempt to force him to join the boxing team and when he refuses, they make his life hell. His sergeant is also having an affair with the captain's wife at the same time, which leads to complications. Based on 
on an apparently very controversial book, one deemed too racy, too long, and too anti-army to make a movie about. Despite that, it became a hit, and it helped Frank Sinatra, who at the time was in a career low. Again, let me repeat how tiny he is in this movie. I mean, it totally changed the way I looked at him. Personally, didn't really like this one. I'm sorry if that offends, but I was just on sleepy mode the whole time. It does have slight Full Metal Jacket vibes, which I like, but with the annoying male characters and the super quick marriages and the army cringe, nah. Again, the third time I read that Ronald Reagan, back in the day an actor if you didn't know, was supposed to be casted in this film, but nope, again. Personally, I just don't really care about soldiers forming relationships like in Best Years of Our Life, and the soundtrack was kind of a snoozer as well. There's also a popular rumor that the plotline in The Godfather with Johnny Fontaine is the real life story of how Frank Sinatra got his role in From Here to Eternity, and this film also is notable for popularizing Aloha shirts back in the day kind of a snooze fest until out of nowhere the Pearl Harbor attack happens right when you think credits are about to roll which I guess picked it up a bit until the terrible ending with the main character dying in the most stupid way possible making from here to eternity I'd say skippable. Finally, 1954 brought us our first mob film, On the Waterfront. I told you we were in classic territory here. It ended up being one of Marlon Brando's most iconic performances. This film is packed with famous quotables, classic scenes, and a lot of wise guys. I needed a movie like this to win Best Picture. You got murder, violence, corruption, extortion, racketeering, and it's based on real people. It follows a boxer again, this time the pigeon-loving Terry, who's involved in a murder case surrounding a corrupt union. On the Waterfront is good, maybe even great. It just didn't live up to the hype in my opinion, but I still enjoyed it. There's a lot of great shots, great moments in the score paired with awesome sound effects, well done symbolism, and a lot of memorable scenes. Marlon's character Terry gets caught in a relationship with the sister of the murder victim, which he's partially responsible for so it leads to a good storyline I have to admit and his role as Terry actually popularized method acting it really wasn't a thing before then. The union leader Johnny Friendly is also really well written and a joy to see. I recognized him from 12 Angry Men and I was glad to see here and the whole based off a true story element of this film actually led to the real life union it was based off of getting shut down. The final courtroom section of the film is exactly that a courtroom section it's nothing crazy there nothing new but overall on the waterfront I'd say is a definite step up from the previous film even if it's still in black and white. It's an undeniable classic that's worth viewing. Now on to 1955's Marty, a nice short and sweet film, actually the shortest runtime ever to win the award, and it follows a middle-aged butcher who's struggling to find a girlfriend until he runs into the overlooked school teacher in the same situation. It's rare that a Best Picture winner solely follows a single man. It's a nice small-scale, bite-sized, cut-and-dry story. It's heartwarming and sometimes sad and really stands out from the other winners. Maybe it was slim pickings in 55, but it's in no way a bad film. I thought Marty was pretty good. Now, blow you away good, but for a small budget and a simple storyline, it gets the job done. It was actually the smallest budget ever to win the Best Picture Award, and at that time, the only movie to spend more promoting the film than the actual budget. The main actor, Ernest Borgnine, also known for being fatso and from here to eternity, did a fantastic job alongside his girlfriend. You just can't help but root for a non-stereotypical couple for a change, especially with all the ugly comments that made no sense. Marty was notable for being based off a TV show, which was never done back back then. Also notable for having Burt Lancaster, also from From Here to Eternity, produce the film but he thought it was gonna flop and he only did it for a tax write-off. It's hard to dislike Marty with the simple themes of love, appearance, and parenting. All wholesome, paired with a digestible plot, has me thinking, yet again, another thumbs up. Just know this is the last black and white film for this section, the last four are color. Around the World in 80 Days from 1956 is a story of a rich man and his newly acquired immigrant valet as they attempt to disprove everyone by circumnavigating the globe in 80 days. You watch as they go from balloon to train to boat and travel through several countries. There's very little beginning setup. It's a full send straight into the 80 day trip. I don't really think the main focus is the story for this movie. It's more about the visuals and the large scale nature. It's deemed the biggest project ever tackled in Hollywood. I mean, let me read you some stats. 
140 sets, 6 Hollywood studios, 69,000 extras and costumes, a cast and crew that traveled 4 million miles to locations of England, France, India, Pakistan, Thailand, Hong Kong, Japan, plus others, 90 animal handlers controlling 8,500 animals. This film was such a big deal upon release, it was treated like Broadway in the theaters, with playbills passed out, reserved seatings, soundtrack was for sale afterward, banned popcorn sales, you weren't allowed to leave your seats, they removed clocks, I mean, it's crazy. I thought Around the World in 80 Days was pretty good, I just require a better balance of story and visuals, but nevertheless, it was a spectacle to behold. I love the cinematography in this film, some of the most unique shots yet. They even achieved a new screen size with this film. I mean, there's funny lines, epic costumes, and just some great moments. It's so dope how the beginning of the movie starts off with the entire Trip to the Moon 1902 film for context. This film's also notable for including a ton of celebrity cameos. Never before done back then, one of them was Frank Sinatra, but he literally doesn't say a thing. The story behind this movie is just so crazy. There's an amusement ride based off this movie. All the bullfighting scenes were real because the actor already knew how and they used 50 gallons of dye for all the Indian extras to match all their skin tones. Even though the story isn't the most gripping thing ever, the ending's pretty abrupt and there's a lot of weird motion blur, it gets a pass because what they accomplished here is epic. Huge scale. But I gotta mention, the chick playing the Indian princess? Come on. Really? Whew. 1957, banger year, responsible for Bridge on the River Kwai, a based on a true story tale of British POWs trapped in a Japanese prison camp forced to build a bridge. The captain thinks it'll be a good morale builder, but the US back at home has other plans. It's not too often we get an action movie of this stature. I mean, this felt right out of the 70s to me. It's right up my alley. I was hooked instantly. I mean, you gotta love Obi-Wan in the lead role. I mean, all the acting is honestly really great. What a great premise for a movie. The US versus Japan versus US. You got the ideas of if you're gonna do it, do it right, always appeasing your higher officer, and the central theme of pride. It just hits so hard. It's got such a good level of seriousness and it does not drag. It doesn't have that cookie cutter formula feel either. The production of this film was crazy. Yes, they actually built that bridge and destroyed it. It cost $250,000 and they used a thousand pounds of dynamite to do it. There's so much controversy with this film as well. With the Oscars won, the story accuracy of the true story, the director nearly drowned, and the shooting conditions were terrible. The real story behind this film that people claim they didn't do justice is insane. They actually built two bridges, not one. A hundred thousand civilians died trying to build those two. It wasn't even over the Kwai River. It later got name changed to that because of the film's popularity, and the actual captain responsible for the build wanted his soldiers to bunch up termites and put them at the supports to sabotage it. And during production, they didn't have enough British extras so they started grabbing natives and painting them white for background extras. I mean the amount of crazy production stories is too much to list. You really gotta look it up. And the villain in this movie of Saito is perfect. He's a really scary dude. You just gotta see this movie. It's a joy to watch start to end. I was in the edge of my seat several times. The epic ass ending. The epic music. Too much to list. Make sure you see this mad classic. From absolute fire to what the hell. 1958's Gigi, excuse me, Gigi, from an American in Paris director and same lead comes a story of a young girl involved in a very weird relationship with an older, richer man who was originally a family friend. Deadass, by far the worst film. I must have majorly missed something because this film is creepy as hell. It is a terrible premise of a 33 year old man being friends with a lady and her daughter and slowly falling in love with the 16 year old daughter Daughter. Some love this film, others don't, including me. I mean, it even got a play adaptation. It's just so predictable. It feels like it's from the 40s or 30s. It's got crazy unlikable characters, a plot you could care less about, terrible writing, it contains grooming, and it has this cringe as hell predator anthem. Each time I see a little girl of five or six or seven, I can't resist a joyous urge to smile and say thank heaven for little girls. 
They grow up in the most delightful way. Those little eyes so helpless and appealing. Gigi contains some bad takes and some mega cringe lines, especially this weird and sensitive suicide line. Congratulations. Your first suicide. Oh, what an achievement. It contains a horrendous ending that wants you to side with the villain, the 33-year-old who keeps flip-flopping on whether Gigi acts too old or not. The only praise I can give this film is the impressive scene shot in front of the mirror where they successfully don't show the camera equipment. There's some cool intro credit scenes and some rarely seen fourth wall narration, and it's kind of cool how Pink Floyd has the soundtrack on one of their covers. I swear, everything surrounding this film is toxic. They had to draw drug the on-screen cat to make it more chill. They had to overdub all of Leslie's singing, which she wasn't pleased about because they didn't think she was any good. In reality, Leslie Karen, the actress who played Gigi, was 27 at the time, but it still makes for a terrible storyline and an uncomfortable watch. If you're watching all the Best Picture winners like me, make sure to skip this doozy. William Wyler is back for a third time to direct an actually good movie this time, 1959's Ben-Hur. What a way to end off this section. We're talking mammoth scale film actually a remake of a film from the 20s. It's notable for being tied for the most Oscars ever won for a film and the only best picture to win the special effects Oscar at the same time. An epic tale of the Jewish prince Judah Ben-Hur who was childhood friends with the Roman commanding officer Masala but now are enemies. Masala then imprisons Ben-Hur, his mom and sister. Ben-Hur escapes and seeks revenge. I absolutely love this film. Charles Heston is back as the lead in a perfectly paced compelling story with a well-integrated religious storyline with literal Jesus Christ in it. I mean, how do you sum up a film as giant as this? First, I gotta list some stats. 15,000 extras, 1 million props, 300 sets taking up 18 acres, 9 sound stages, 18 chariots built, 200 camels, 2,500 horses, 40 ship miniatures built, 40 tons of sand, 40 tons of cubic feet of lumber, 1,000 pounds of plaster used for the impressively built sets, 400 pounds of hair, you gotta mention that, and a chariot scene that alone cost $4 million in five weeks to film. Man, that chariot scene, oh my god is it epic. It contains some of the most impressive shots I've ever seen. It has some really cool practical effects with the dummies, the dynamite, the hardcore as hell stunts, even cameras got wrecked and a couple horses died. Quick side note, someone bought one of the chariots used in this film and rode it on the highway and then got arrested? The arena that the race takes place in was actually built for this film, which is so insane. All the sets were so impressive they had tours going through during filming. Ben-Hur is such a spectacle to watch. It's visually crisp, they're using state-of-the-art cameras, the color looks great, it just aged so well. The story the storyline keeps you hooked, even though it's three and a half hours. The storyline with the two old friends fighting is so compelling, paired with the storylines of leprosy, anti-semitism, and Christianity, making it actually the only Vatican-approved film. Like that means anything, but it's notable nonetheless. I'll include some more on-screen fun facts worth mentioning, but I just gotta say that even though this is my second time seeing this movie, I don't remember much from the first time, it's a joy to watch the rise and fall and rise again of Ben-Hur. There's countless memorable moments, and it's just such a cool time period to make a movie about. I enjoyed it endlessly, and just make an effort to see this movie. Since I'm 32 deep, I thought I'd brew up a formula for what I think is needed to win Best Picture. I believe if you include these seven key ingredients, you have a good chance to win. It's likely I'll tweak this formula in the future. First off, there needs to be an on-screen relationship to get the public hooked. It's pretty much essential, and the stronger the chemistry, the better. It's so important, and you might want to throw a marriage in there. People seem to love that. Have a long runtime. Most of these films are quite long with a few exceptions. A long runtime allows for a thorough story to be told, but make sure it holds attention. My rule is if you're not a horror film or a comedy, keep it above an hour and a half. You gotta have the critics on your side, and you have to have good fan reception. You can't make a movie for one or the other. It might be obvious, but good press and word of mouth is a reason why a lot of these films win. You could make the most technically impressive film of all time, but if the big media outlets don't agree and the fans aren't feeling it, then your chances of winning are pretty low. It also helps if you're the highest grossing film of the year. That's usually the case for a lot of these winners. 
there's a successful novel, Broadway play, or other film that hasn't been done justice on screen, be that person to bring it to life. Because if it worked then, it'll probably work again with another group. The lead is crucial to how enjoyable some of these films are. The overall acting doesn't need to be amazing, but if you have at least one over-the-top good performance, you're likely to win. My personal favorite is funny or badass leads. Be controversial. Push boundaries with the subject matter. The saying, all publicity is good publicity, definitely applies here. If there's some apprehension before release or it's thought to flop, that's a sign for success. Lastly, it's got to be ahead of its time conceptually, visually, or technologically. That's the number one similarity I noticed between these films, nailed in one of those departments for each film. Create a unique concept. Don't be a trend butter. Attempt to tell a story that's never before done. When it comes to the first 32, or what I like to call the first definitive era of the Best Picture Award, this would be my ranking of favorites, with number one being Bridge on the River Kwai as my favorite, and of course Gigi as 32, by far my least favorite. I'd say the top 10 are solid as hell films that you should make an effort to see. The middle ones are more, if you're trying to see them all, you might as well watch those as well, and I'd say the bottom five are very skippable. This ranking might contain a few controversial takes but these are just my opinions and just know that I might update this ranking list in one of the future video installments. Okay, well, that's it for the first 32 films. Overall, I'd say they had a lot more substance to them than I originally thought. I'd say they're all pretty good besides Gigi. My god, was that terrible. But, I mean, even if each film wasn't my favorite, I get why most of them won. I really think watching them in order is the way to go because it is fun to watch the quality increase little by little from film to film. And the transition to color gives you a similar feeling that people had when it was first introduced low-key. One of the things I noticed the most towards the end of my watching was those typical cliche scenes and cliche dialogue and filming angles. Stuff we're tired of today is also in those older films, but it's likely they originated from those films, so at the time, they weren't even cliche. That's just something that dawned on me towards the end. I just really found it interesting to observe. For those who care, I watched all 32 films perfectly in 30 days, reaching my goal, with about one to three movies a day watched, and a running total of 71 hours and 22 minutes so far. And for some of those long boys, those double VHS, I had to split those into multiple viewings if I'm being honest. Also, if you're interested, I added my Letterboxd account in the description where I added these film reviews. So anyway, stay tuned for the next installment where I cover 1960 to 1989. In the Lasers era.